Hello, and welcome to the lecture on Six Characters in Search of an Author, Act 1. In this lecture, I will be reading through notes that introduce you to concepts of postmodernism, literary theory, and then applying those to Six Characters in Search of an Author, the first act. For our final unit this semester, we will look at how modern and contemporary literature brings us back to the questions with which we began this semester. Why are we telling stories? And how do stories relate to our identities? Currently, literature is typically defined by a term called postmodernism. While postmodernism is a complex artistic movement, we will examine its use in more simplistic terms as it applies to the play Six Characters in Search of an Author. First, it's important to know that this type of literature moves from telling stories that are plot-driven to focusing on the telling of stories itself. Instead of an emphasis on character, plot, or mode, the emphasis is on language, representation, and the artifice of art. Postmodern texts usually refer to themselves as text, which is called metatextuality. They also draw attention to the false nature of textuality and may even discuss language and the nature of writing. In this type of writing, some of the stories can focus on the pointlessness of even telling a story at all. Why write if writing is just a story and not action in the real world? Isn't it meaningless? However, other stories show writing as powerful because to control one's story, to shape one's narrative, is equivalent to having control over your life and who you choose to be. So even though postmodern texts can seem absurd or full of despair, they also ask us to think about how we can still have hope within the practice of shaping stories. We began this semester by asking why we tell stories and how certain narratives might transcend cultures and apply to our lives. Now, the telling of stories themselves comes under scrutiny. For this unit, we will look at different ways to analyze stories beyond basic elements like form and mode. Using three different types of literary criticism, we will try to decipher a postmodern text and conclude by thinking about the importance and value of literature in our contemporary world. First, we'll begin with a broad look at literary theory. Criticism of literature occurs when we read, analyze, and discuss the way that we can interpret a text. Literary theory is simply the variety of perspectives, or theories, that people use to explain what a text means. In this unit, we will look at three schools of thought for literary theory, new historicism, cultural studies, and reader response. Each week, I will give you some information about one of these schools, and then we will practice applying that type of theory to an act of six characters. This week, we will start with new historicism. This type of theory privileges the author's history and background as a way of understanding the literary text. If you want to practice new historical literary theory, you would first study the author's life and historical circumstances. Then, when you read their text, you would look for ways that the text demonstrates things about the author's life or time period. New historicism finds the value of literature and its role as a document of a history of ideas. When we use this type of theory to understand a text, we assume that the author's background and history cannot be separated from the type of literature they write. The author is a part of history. The text needs to be connected to history in order to get the best interpretation of it. Let's start our discussion of six characters in search of an author by using new historicism. First, we need to know more about the author, Luigi Pirandello. You can read the details about him by clicking the, the link, which will be an active link within the PDF that is posted. So Luigi Pirandello lived from 1867 to 1936. Pirandello lived during the modern era, but the fact that he discusses the nature of art and illusion in his texts puts him in the tradition of postmodernism, even if he was a bit ahead of his time. Pirandello is known for breaking down the comfortable illusion of theater. He doesn't let the audience sit passively in their seats and watch a play, but instead points out that they are watching a fiction. They aren't allowed to completely escape into the world of art. Characters in his text often question their own reality. Fiction seems to come to life. Or he might ask his readers to question their own lives as a type of fiction. 
There are several things about Pirandello's life and historical background that might be relevant to his work. He got a doctorate in the study of Romance languages, with a thesis on the dialect of his hometown. He had an arranged marriage, and his wife suffered from insanity. He was relatively wealthy due to his family's merchant business and sulfur mines, but when the mines collapsed, he suddenly had to earn a living. He describes the themes of identity and reality that are in his work in psychological terms, and he studied psychology extensively. His work was, was supported by Mussolini, and at one point he proclaimed himself a fascist. These are just a few points that I picked out for you to consider, but a true new historicist reading would examine Pirandello's life in great detail by reading book-length biographies of his life or by examining the historical circumstances of Italian life in the early 20th century in order to make the best analysis of his texts. Now let's look at the actual text. Try to keep Pirandello's background in mind as you read. When the play begins, the curtain is up. This breaks the illusion that you, as an audience member, will see a show. Notice also that the stage directions, which are in italics, indicate that the sets of stairs lead into the audience. This setup breaks the sealed-off nature of the stage as separate from the audience. As the play begins, there is construction on set still going on. This implies that the play is not ready to be performed, and gives the effect that the play we see has no real beginning. All of these, these things work together to get the audience asking the question, what is real and what is performed? Raising this question so early in the play helps to emphasize that the play will be about the nature of art. Remember, one characteristic of postmodernism is self-referential texts. We also see this immediately in Act 1. There is a reference to the character's rehearsal of another play by Pirandello, The Game of Role Playing. By putting another one of his own texts into the play we are watching or reading, Pirandello again reminds us that what we are seeing or reading is a fiction. This forces us to deal with our relationship to the text rather than just letting us enjoy the experience of watching or reading the text. Next, we are introduced to the characters. These are not actors who will continue to play false personas during the course of a play. Instead, they are art come to life. They are out of an unfinished novel. This implies that the author has creativity akin to a god's. The author created them, but then left the novel incomplete, so they haven't been able to play out the roles he made for them. As the title of the play indicates, the characters are in search of an author. They want someone to let them tell their stories through to the end. They need to complete their narratives. The stage directions explain how the use of masks will distinguish the characters. Their faces are eternal and unchanging. They are not like actors who can depict several different identities. Once created, the play implies, art is fixed. The next place we see the text exhibit postmodern characteristics occurs when the father and the manager, or director, depending on your translation, discusses the difference between acting and art. This philosophical discussion critiques theater and again presents the question to the audience, which is more real, life as we live it or life as we depict it in art? Which is more true? Consider the discussion about the role of the author. Remember, if we examine a text new historically, we want to interpret it in light of the actual author's own experiences. In this case, we should ask, how does the author the characters mention connect to the actual author, Luigi Pirandello? Look for places that refer to the author and to historical events or societal practices. Another example of postmodernism occurs during the father's speech about the problems of communication. Postmodern texts address the problem of language because, of course, Literature is composed of language. Words and language are abstract. You can't touch them or see them. They exist as ideas, not in the material world. Often, postmodern texts use the abstract nature of language to express the problems of identity and communication. If words are not actually real, in other words, material, then how can they have any meaning? And if what we say has no meaning, how do we create a meaningful identity in the world? As the father says, we think we understand each other, but we never do.
In this play, the problems of communication are emphasized in order to produce feelings of despair in the audience. However, other postmodern authors use the same problem of abstract language to play with the way that stories can provide freedom. For example, if language is abstract, it can create anything, giving it great power rather than making it meaningless. I'm intentionally avoiding a description of the play's plot this week because I want you to have the experience that the real audience did, one that requires you to read or listen carefully and to decipher all the action rather than having it explained to you, which is another characteristic of postmodern literature. I also have avoided giving an interpretation using new historicism because I want you to practice this for yourself. Don't worry if you feel a bit confused about the play's action right now. It will become more clear as we read, but the main thing to remember this week is that we want to look at what is revealed about the characters, how the play connects to postmodernism, and how we might try to interpret Act 1 based on new historicism. The last few pages of Act 1, in particular, reveal circumstances that we might try to connect to Pirandello's own family life. See what you think and try to argue for an interpretation using the new historical theory in this week's optional discussion. Please note, since Pirandello is trying to interrupt our regular experience of viewing and reading a play, the text does not include formal breaks between the acts of the play. You will read where the curtain until where the curtain remains up and the action stops for intermission. This is the end of Act 1. Thanks.